Welcome to Blacktop Pulpit. I'm Andrew. I'm here with Ken. We are the elders in Douglas Reformed Church. And, uh, well, we're here to talk about, I guess, the sermon from this morning. This it was, sermon from this morning. It was, it was quite a different sort of sermon that you... <laughs> I have never heard anything like that in church come from anyone else. So you're calling yourself a heretic then? Nope. Preaching some unique message from the gospel. I, I went back to what was preached historically, but all those guys died, so I never got <laughs> yeah. to hear them. Um, and I'm and I know some other guys who preach that, right? I'm just saying, in a church setting, a church that I have been a part of, I've never heard anybody else preach that. that. Most people have been a part of. Yeah, yeah. So, but I know other guys who preach exactly that. So, it's, oh, it's, that's good. It's that's not unique to me. <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah, yeah. This is man. I mean. Oh, wait, Pauline. wait, 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 wait. Here we go. I have to ask my question. No, what? please don't. What? <laughs> we almost made it. What did you think about the sermon this morning? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> 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 it's uh, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> what did I think of the sermon? Like, uh, you're gonna, if you keep preaching, man, you're going to become more post mill than I am. <laughs> if there is such a thing. I'm just reading the Bible. I know. And that's really what it comes down to. And it amazes me. Like, when you resolve to... It doesn't matter what I believe. I just want to understand more what the Bible says. You just start working through it, like, really carefully. Right, right, um, right. Really carefully, um, which can be monotonous, right? But you work through it really carefully, and you do the exegesis of the passage. And you see, this can't mean anything else. Like, this is what the Bible is saying, and it's not what most people are teaching. That's a scary right. reality to come up against. Yeah, uh-huh. and and it, it's also a problem with the majority of you know Christians kind of devotions because if you're just reading chunks of the Bible passages with some you know helpful semi helpful kind of feedback or commentary from a person that's giving you a, a daily encouragement, you know that's fine. That but that's not going to get you. Uh, <laughs> sanctified <laughs> right you know it's not gonna that's not gonna be it's not gonna be doing the work of of transformation that is only in the scriptures yeah that's more in like you know benefiting from other people which you do and i do and it like like that's definitely a, a part of the church but man like going through the scripture like you're saying the monotony of it, of it like only seems monotonous until like you start working through it and then it's like you know yeah maybe for you know the first 10 minutes you're like man what's here and then all of a sudden like christ grabs you yeah. let me show you something son yeah. or daughter well, well, it's like it's like uh it's aggravating to learn a new board game yeah, yeah? that's a great example all right. for me so it's, <laughs> so it's just aggravating to learn the rules and the first like 10 times you play it or whatever, always having to go back to the instructions and like, oh, what was that? What did that card mean? You know, yeah. if I roll this on the dice, I get to go again. What? I need to remember those things. And what, how do I know if I'm winning or losing? And you go back to the instructions. How do I know you're not cheating? But, right, right. And so <laughs> you keep having to go back to the instructions. It's like, ah, oh, this is so monotonous. Just, this yeah. game just, it's not worth what I'm putting into it. I'm not really having fun. But then you get the rules mm-hmm. and then you play the game and you know the rules and the other people playing with you know the rules and it's, and then it, it's fun and it's addicting. You're like, oh, we got to play that game. Right. Um, the Bible, infinitely more so. <laughs> you know? The best game like the ever. Best, <laughs> the game of life. But not the board game, life. the Bible. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, it's... Uh, yeah. So you get in there and and it's hard, it's hard for people to switch their brains um, because nothing we read is like the Bible. We read a cool story mm-hmm. and it flows logically, you know. But then you go in and you read the Bible and the words actually mean something. They're right. actually powerful. And it takes it does take work to understand what what the author's intent was when you wrote a book. And that's really what we want to get at, right? Is the, the author's intent there. Um, but when we when we practice studying the Bible and it's not just not just a little devotional, but it's actually exegetical study and mm-hmm. when and when all the people in the church are doing exegetical study, right? And, and everybody not, can do it. Not, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not it's, some like... It's only for scholars. No. You know? No, not even close. Like, the pastor should not be the only one in the church doing exegetical mm-hmm. study. Um, if he is, he needs to train his people to read the Bible. Right? right. People need to learn how to read the Bible. So read the Bible and understand the meaning of a text. And we know the basic rules of exegesis and of 
um, figuring out like uh, context and maybe you don't you don't even really in most cases have to understand history or know what's going on historically um, because the the literature gives you everything you need mm-hmm. right there as yeah. sola scriptura right it helps to understand the history but it's not right. essential to understanding the Bible right so you get the context there and you see how arguments are working out in the text and how immediate context speaks to the meaning of words and phrases and then the context of the book you're reading and the context of that book in the in the whole of the Bible and you understand those rules of study and exegesis, mm-hmm. man, studying the Bible gets addicting. Yeah. No doubt. Because you, and all of a sudden you're running into all this stuff like you never, I never heard anybody preach that. And I got to warn the listeners at this point, right? You'll get angry because you'll realize how much you haven't heard from mm. the pulpit mm-hmm. um, in our culture today. And I know I did. Um, but it's not worth getting angry about. Just buckle in. Join us for Blacktop Pulpit. Get to, get to <laughs> Douglas go. Reformed Church. Let's, let's <laughs> Problem <this> solved. <laughs> well, I think that's one of those topics you could probably get angry on and not sin. Because the question is, why are there so many <laughs> preachers today not preaching the word? That's, that's a yeah. Or not big preaching the question. whole council. They just, right. they just go to certain pet passages and topics. Yeah. Um, and even if they're correct on that, they're not giving the whole council of Scripture, just the part they like. Just the part yeah. they're attracted to. Or if it's not a matter yeah. of liking or disliking, it's like today's passage where it just doesn't fit your theology. <laughs> and that's what we're going to talk about today, which I love it. I, I mean, love it. And how many people would just skip over that? Like, Oh, eh, yeah. 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 But we can't skip over it. <laughs> I don't quite understand this. So, no, we're not going to go here today. <laughs> no, we'll go here today. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love oh, it. Man. So that we got the recap of, you know, last week, which... Paul recaps in verse 20. Mm-hmm. Um, then, but, but in the in first Christ, if in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by one man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Um, man, I don't see. I'm thinking, I want to work through. Each one of these, just because there's so much here, but then I'm like, oh, we're going to end up doing like a two hour episode. I don't want to do that. Because <laughs> ah, seriously. There was me, a lot me, of explanation let me, let me, about that in the sermon. So yeah. Just go and listen to the sermon. For yeah. Let's, let's, let, I, I'm, I'm going to bring up some um, highlight, highlighted points. I would say that were important realities from this passage that you preached on today that I want to emphasize. Yeah. And this um, passage is one of those like deep, deep theological like realities. Right. Uh, this is probably one of the more important pericopes in the book when it comes to understanding theology and what Christ is doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is the one nobody knows. Everybody skips over it. <laughs> it's the one nobody it's, knows. <laughs> you know. It's, That's a big problem. So let's fix that. Uh, man can't rightly exercise dominion over creation in his sin. Now, right. That was that was an important point brought up and and it got my mind like my mind and oftentimes during, you know, various sermons or teachings, um, I try to stay with the the speaker while also kind of working down my own thought process, but I got to be careful because then I tune out and I don't want to <laughs> do that either. Um, but that got me thinking. Um, so, geez, where is it? So, dominion. So, in so, you, you quoted Psalm eight when it comes to the dominion of man, and that was like God, God's instruction and, and purpose for man. Mm-hmm. And one of my thoughts was that God gave dominion to man and when man sinned against him he didn't take it away right um we see that that's in the psalm even david is writing that so in david's time man mankind still has dominion over the earth yeah Uh, yeah Yeah. and that that was just like a thought process that that i had kind of entered down nothing nothing super enlightening for me as far as like oh like some new revelation here but it was just really (laughs) 
it was enlightening in the aspect of it's like, you know, it it, sh- it kind of re- reflects God's faithfulness and His consistency of maintaining His promises and purposes mm-hmm. and like and not his, changing and His design. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that whole thing about God denying Himself, most religious worldviews, even some that refer to themselves as Christian, they present a God who constantly denies Himself. Right. Mm-hmm. The Bible doesn't do that. Right. And we see that in yeah. this passage, um, especially as we hit Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and then Psalm 8, and then 1 Corinthians, and we see the continuity there of what God is doing. It's mm-hmm. just amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh, here comes. Oh, here come the drinks. Oh, man. <laughs> the Lord is good. And so is my dear wife. <laughs> oh, man. Muchísimas gracias, señorita. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're not doing video anymore. Nobody can oh, see yeah, it. Oh, yeah, I feel like, what's going on right now? All I hear is clink, clink, bloop, 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 bloop. There you go. Open that for you. <laughs> yeah. Thank so, you. and working through this passage, man, just so enlightening. Of course, me, I like, I wait until like the last moment to to make a definite conclusion. So sometimes you ask mm-hmm. me, like, like like the question you've been asking through 1 Corinthians, like, already not yet. What do you think about that? And like today, I like finally just had to land somewhere. Like, so a passage forces me to land there so that I can preach the passage. And yeah. it's like, no, that really is just a contradictory statement. Yeah. I don't think the Bible presents it, you know? Yeah, that's, um, that's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> Sorry. It's just, <laughs> no, it's, Sorry. Fine. it's 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 funny. It's 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 been like I don't get serious about it. Like whenever people say that, I'm how dare you say that? Oh, you man. contradictory fool. <laughs> but it is like I like, I'm glad I'm glad you said that um, because I feel the same way when when people talk that way to try to explain most often than not some idea or I got it things. Um, some position or interpretation that does not flow with the scriptures is not consistent with uh, God's revelation. Like when people say God died on the cross. Oh man, no, yeah. no, I've always not. been <laughs> a, a hard hitter with that. It, with my kids, like yeah. it, from a, from a novice standpoint, like that was natural for all of them. Almost mostly, mostly Genesis. Yeah. Um, because you know we taught stories and whatnot, and she kind of she grabbed hold of the reality of who Christ is, mm-hmm. his divinity, which is awesome. Yeah. But then, like she she kind of equated reasonably because that's yeah. more advanced theology when you talk about well, Christ in his body died on the cross, but the, the divinity but God, God did, not. did not die. Right. He didn't because dying would be meaning you cease, mm-hmm. um, and and yeah. God doesn't cease. That's right. Um, or on on Facebook. And you get a comment. I think you saw this comment thread. Um, the topic was uh, Trinitarian belief, and a Muslim commented on that, yeah. like trying to argue against Trinitarian belief. Mm-hmm. And his understanding of Trinity was that God is both one and three of the same substance, mm-hmm. and that is really is contradictory. Right. So he's right to point out if somebody actually believes that, it is contradictory to say God is both one substance and three substances. Mm-hmm. But that's not at all what Trinitarian belief is, right? Trinitarian belief is God is one substance, yeah. but three persons. So we're not saying God is one in three. We're saying God is one substance existing in three persons. And so that's two different things. You can have one substance and three persons, but you can't have something that's both one substance and three substances. Or you can't have something. <laughs> and you I'm, can't have something that's both one person and three persons. I'm right? trying to think if there's you know any sect, which I wouldn't even call them a sect, that that teaches something along those lines. Like where does that where does that idea come from, or is it just from a confused perspective? It's just from a confused perspective. Kind of negligence. Right. No, there's not a group. There are groups it, that claim to be Christian that deny Trinitarianism. Which right. Is really weird. Right. Um, but there, but nobody defines Trinity as one substance and three substances. It's mm-hmm. um, it's it's a straw man that's built outside of the Christian camp in order to attack the Christian worldview. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, and it's a terrible straw man even uh, right? because it's, you can easily defeat it and point it out. Hey, that's a straw man. Uh, you're building that just so you could try to win an argument. Right. And that's not actually what we believe. So when somebody says, Oh, you believe God is both one substance and three substance. All I got to do is say, 
No, I don't. I don't know what you're arguing against. Right. <laughs> you you know? would say that, but the problem is yeah. a lot of Christians don't have any really good basic understanding of the Trinity. <laughs> right. Cool. Read First Corinthians. Yeah. There's a lot of the Trinity right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. Speaking of Trinity... <laughs> Are we going to talk about Matrix? <laughs> That's not where I was going with it, but okay. you know, I heard the la- the the latest movie was terrible, dreadful. <laughs> dreadful. So. Super fan here, super disappointed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of Trinity, in the text today, said that uh, the Son will forever be subjected to the Father, and the Father is never subjected to the Son. Right. Um, <clears throat> there's a. A new theological perspective, uh, relatively new, uh, called eternal subordination of the sun. And that is kind of like eternal generation of the sun, but eternal generation of the sun is a little bit more historic and more basic than the doctrine called eternal subordination of the sun. Uh, what are your thoughts there? You knew we were going to get into this uh, before we started. so Yeah, so <clears throat> the idea is something that's very important uh, for... I mean, even even when you're talking about the Trinity, um, <clears throat> that the, the, at face value, it's it's great because Paul does this typical thing, but he's he's, he's exposing like the glory of God, like in his writing. So yeah. so when when we read it, and like he's come to an understanding that you know because of what God showed him, you know he has to keep him keep Paul humble, you know, so he gets the thorn in his side because of of the glories that he saw when when. He was shown the the levels of heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, in d- verse twenty seven, this is like it's funny because it's like, but when he says all things are put in subjection to him, it is just plain. So Paul's like, it's obvious, it's obvious that <laughs> yeah. that he he meaning Christ is accepted, and you pointed out, ex, you know, accepted, not accepted, right? And who put all things un- under subjection under him? He's like, oh, so your first your first glance is. Oh, okay. That well, that fits my understanding of the sovereignty and and dominion and equality of, of Christ with the Father. You know, like he he had claimed, um, because well, it's obvious. You know, obviously <laughs> Jesus isn't put under subjection to the Father. But then you read the next verse, <laughs> and then it goes, "Oh, when all things are subjected to Him, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him. Put all things in subjection under Him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that God may be." All in all, so yeah, yeah, like like at first glance, from a simplistic theology of who Christ is, it's like, oh well, obviously he's accepted from the subjection because he's equal. He's equal with the Father. But well, that verse is actually saying that the Father is accepted from the subjection of the world to Christ, right? And that's what that verse is saying. Verse twenty-seven. Yeah. Mm. Um, but it is very interesting. We do see attention throughout the Bible. And that's probably why it's such a hot topic, because in some places you see uh, the Father and Son are co-eternal and co-equal, and it seems like not one is subjected to the other, and they do everything right. together, the inseparable works of the Trinity, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the united work of the Trinity, and we see that throughout Scripture, but then you have weird passages like this that seem to go against that and go against the grain, talking about the father being the head of the son who is the head of a man, which we saw early, previously in 1 Corinthians here, and in passages like this where it says, and at the end, when the son hands his kingdom over to the father, mm-hmm. he himself will also be subject to the father. And it's like, what, right. do, you, what do you do with that? And And... Why is there this tension? Uh, why do we seem to read two conflicting ideas in the text of Scripture? They're co-equal, co-eternal, mm-hmm. yet the Son is subjected to the Father. Like, how do we think about that? And that, I think, is where the ESS debate comes in, or the uh, e- EFS, like eternal functional subordination. Like, some people started using that terminology. Mm-hmm. And then go back to, to eternal generation, which actually, I think, is a term that's even more helpful but still, we have to know in the scripture there are tough ideas to wrestle with. Yeah, and this one, um, Paul is talking a lot about the humanity of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not really focusing on the divinity of Christ, and so 
Uh, it's fair for us when we read this text to um, assume that Paul is talking about the humanity of Christ rather than the divinity of Christ. So in his divinity, co-equal, co-eternal, and his humanity because of the hypostatic union, right? He's both God and man, has both natures, and his humanity mm-hmm subject to the Father in this way. And so I wouldn't say eternal subordination Mm -hmm. because they're co-equal, co-eternal in the transcendent uh, trinity. I would say eternal generation because the Son is always proceeding from the Father. And so I like that terminology. Um, But I would say because Christ took on humanity, assumed human flesh and human nature, was resurrected in human flesh and human nature, he still has that and will never lose it, mm-hmm. that always and forever in his humanity and his human flesh and nature will always be subjected to the Father. But in his divinity will always be co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, which is really just mind-boggling and twisting. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> that, that, that later view would be eternal generation. What is the eternal generation? Subordination? Uh, the later view, the one that came later, uh-huh. the one that's fairly recent, is uh, eternal subordination of the Son. I thought that was the first one that you mentioned. It's the first so one I mentioned, but it's the, gen- it's the view that came later. Uh, uh, eternal e- subordination. E- eternal generation, eternal generation was developed yeah. in the Middle Ages, or termed in the Middle mm-hmm. Ages, when they were trying to figure out Trinitarian thought mm-hmm. and really define the Trinity. Uh, and that's the one I prefer. Um, I, I think eternal subordination of the Son can come dangerously close to heresy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it always does develop into heresy, but I think it comes dangerously close. It's easy to jump from that to, oh, well, Christ must not then be co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's easy to make that jump, and that's the reason I don't necessarily care for that terminology. Well, yeah, and then our Muslim friends would just laugh at us and be like, well, that's because, because he has no need of a son. Right, which actually ends up being a contradiction in the in the Quran, right? Yeah. Um, forcing God to deny himself because initially, like mentioned in the sermon, he gave humanity representative rule over the earth, even according to Quran, and then mm-hmm. later... He denies himself by taking that representative role away from humanity and just renewing the world because there's no incarnation. Mm. Um, so Inconsistent. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, something I hope our Muslim friends who may listen to this uh, think about if they hear it. You know, It's important to think about stuff and things. Yeah, stuff and things. <laughs> <laughs> um. You'd mentioned another important part that's in this passage uh, that's in verse, I think it was 23. Let's see, 23 to 24. Um, Each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. They're talking about the resurrection. resurrection. Mm -hmm. And verse 24 is, then comes the end. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. So (laughs) this was an important (laughs) highlight. There's no there's no room there for a thousand year period to be inserted. Not after his return. Yeah. Right. Um, Yeah. So so there's the idea that that Christ returns and. Then the kingdom begins. Yeah, so that would be the, the dispensational point of view, mm-hmm. right? So dispensational, premillennial point of view, and all dispensationals, to my knowledge, are pre-mill, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so maybe we should say premillennial, dispensational, put it in that order, because yeah. you're pre-mill before you're dispensational. Yep. Uh, so they believe, um, and this is where I was too, growing up in a Southern Baptist church, because almost every Southern Baptist thinks this way, right? That Christ comes... In the recent generation, yeah. In the recent generation, (laughs) yeah. So Christ comes, and it's his second coming, and at his second coming, he establishes his millennial kingdom and Mm -hmm. reigns on the earth with the saints for a thousand years over the other nations of the earth. And it really is, uh, I agree with Greg Bonson, it really seems to be sort of a militant um, ruling over the nations, right? Right. And uh, the the last battle, even... 
what at the end of the thousand years is Armageddon when uh, Satan is uh, released from his binds, uh, from his chains, and he brings an army against this millennial <laughs> kingdom, which seems kind of ridiculous. Um, but we grow up hearing it, so we yeah. get used to it. Um, and what we what we get used to hearing, uh, we don't think about it as ridiculous usually. Um, mm-hmm. But really, if you just listen to that story, try to listen to it with a fresh mind, it just seems really out there. Right? Yeah. Um, but that's how people interpret the book of Revelation. And this millennial kingdom in the book of Revelation only gets a few verses and people build entire theologies on just a few verses in Revelation and they end up contradicting the rest of the Bible. Right. Uh, which is crazy, right? And the rest of Revelation. Yeah, the rest of Revelation, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so uh, when we talk about this millennial kingdom and the fact that here in 1 Corinthians, and you just read it, it says that when Christ returns... At that point, he won't begin to rule according to this passage, mm-hmm. according to this pericope. At that point, upon his return, he's finished ruling the nations right. with an iron scepter, which means the 1,000 year, this millennial kingdom, it's located prior to his return. Right. Now. Because at his return, yeah. he's giving it up. He gives the kingdom over. Right. right. So, so yeah. where, where, let's, let's be dispy for a moment. I can't anymore. <laughs> Come on, man! Was, you just said I was that's there. where you were raised. So and I was. So bring back yeah. some of your roots. Like I can't help me back. understand <laughs> this from a, from a dispensational perspective because when Paul speaks like this, like what, what do you do with it? Christ comes, and then when he comes, he delivers the kingdom to the Father. So what what was the teaching, or what's the 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 kind of speaking away this text like i i don't know that i've heard a decent answer to this text and i certainly never remember hearing this text presented in church growing up so this might have been one of those that were kind of evaded in in the church yeah evasion that's right yeah um i'm not interested in evading biblical text i want to understand what god is doing Mm -hmm. Um, i imagine though if i were to ask someone about this text they would say, well, there might be room there for the kingdom not to be handed over immediately. Mm. But just plain reading of the text, it's like, it says at the end, resurrection, Christ returns, resurrections <laughs> the at end. the end. And it says at the end, when Christ hands the kingdom over to the father, like there's no, yeah. there really is no room grammatically um, to right. separate that. So if we're reading scripture and we're interpreting it literally, what I mean by literally, this is, the way I interpret scripture, right? What I mean when I say I interpret the Bible literally, uh, not necessarily literalistically, but literally means I take a historical, grammatical approach to biblical interpretation, mm-hmm. right? Um, there's simply no room here to read the Bible literally and to separate that and to insert a thousand year period. Right. Uh, you just can't do that with the text. Uh, if, if, if we do that with this text, we're being unfaithful to exposition of the Bible um, and we're doing that for the sake of a theology we already have so changing with the Bible changing trying to change what the Bible says in order to appease our own sensibilities but, but that's, Andrew that's a terrible place hold, to be. hold on because it's the post millennialist that that interpret things so figuratively and spiritually you know we're the ones that aren't the literalists when it comes to the text, so right? So I invite an answer to my interpretation. <laughs> Let's have a conversation. Yeah, I would like a conversation. Um, another simple or thing. Or a public debate. I'm down. Man, I think that would be a lot of fun. I think it would be too. You know, a, a really like kind-spirited, like fun, light-hearted, but serious topic yeah. debate. I, I've never, I've never uh, participated in... In a well-organized public debate, I would, mm. I would love the opportunity to do that. Mm. Now that I'm a little more mature and I don't nice. have to get mad at everything. <laughs> Why is it when we're immature we do this kind of rage about you know being challenged and you know, know. thinking we know everything? And yeah. is it is it where everyone starts or is it majority? What would you say? Like, because you know, I, I had a I had similar tendencies when you know, especially when when Calvinism lit my my theology up and I was like, holy cow! Like so, that's interesting though. But because it doesn't have to just be Calvinism, and it could be just be just knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge puffs up. Go figure. The yeah. Bible says. All right. It, right. So I had some extra for our listeners. I uh, 
part of my hobby and my side hustle, I cut steel, right? For yeah. people. I'll do it for fabrication and for aesthetics and signs and, and whatever. Um, and so I had some extra like one inch or one and a quarter inch thick steel uh, already pre-cut in some circles. So I posted on the Facebook group like, hey, I got some of this steel. I would definitely use it as a shooting target if mm-hmm. you want me to, you know, get you one as a shooting target or, or whatever you need. Nice. Just let me know. Um, and this one dude who actually like, uh, he, he's actually a metallurgist. He commented on there. He, a metallurgist? Metallurgist. Yeah. Something like that. He commented, he, obviously he knows more about metal than me. Right. That's something new <laughs> okay. today. I know, I know how to cut it. <laughs> right? uh, so he's, he's all, let me teach you a few things, son. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's all like trying to teach me all these things about metal. And mm. that, yeah. I learned quite a bit. It was, yeah. like, it was a good conversation. But he was so like obnoxious in the conversation. I was like, huh. there's a better way to approach this. Yeah. Like, uh, so anyway, he made a comment like, you're so dumb and you're so ignorant and Seriously. whatever, whatever, whatever. And I was Good like, grief. I was like, I am ignorant about quite a bit. So I just put a little winky face on there. Like, that's how my mentality has changed. Cause like old me before Christ me, thanks like, come B- out. BC me. I'm like, oh, it's on, man. You call me? <laughs> Let me tell you why you're dumb. No, just a little winky face and the argument's over. It's done. <laughs> But it's yeah. like no, uh, we we should listen to people who know more than us. Oh yeah, That's absolutely. It. So so I agreed with them right there, and I said, "Yep, uh, people should know the differences between this steel and like AR five hundred. Obviously, AR five hundred is a better quality metal, right?" And so I was, oh sure, pe- sure. People should know the difference. I love that AR five hundred. Yeah, <laughs> people people should know the difference and practice safe shooting habits. And so I put that on there, and and they started arguing with with me again after I agreed Jeez. with them. I was like, "Dang, man, what's going?" And then somebody commented like, "These comments really made me want to buy some of this steel." <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "Oh my goodness!" <laughs> yeah, and it's, sometimes arguing just makes you look dumb. But no, yeah. a, a well organized public debate um, where you know set it up a de- decently and in order is what the scriptures tell us to do, and uh, respectably where you're, you're having a conversation instead of just yelling across the room or. Ad hominem attacks and trying right. to avoid all that. Like that's, what that's where you want to be. That's yeah. uh, that's called reasoning together. And I think mm-hmm. the world has forgotten how to reason together. Right. Um, I think we need to bring some of that to Douglas. We, man, we, can, we can we can kind of start that here. I wouldn't mm-hmm. mind getting on that like actually really really quickly here. Mm-hmm. I like that idea. Mm-hmm. Huh? I'm down. Sweet. Cool. James White, come on, man. <laughs> Show us your ways. <laughs> fantastic that's an open invitation there uh, Mr. White he's not going to hear this <laughs> that's true um, there's another when it comes to just the, the plain reading of, of Paul's teaching here uh, talking about the resurrection that we do look forward to a a bodily resurrection at coming of christ right so we've seen this presented by paul in various passages he brings it up here um and he's being sequential about what's happening too Mm -hmm. which is important but one of the things that we get to grab hold of that's encouraging is the reality of a bodily resurrection so so one of our our dispositions of understanding of, of the afterlife, so to speak, or the next life or the heavenly realm is that, you know, a very basic understanding or our thought would be that we're all floating around in clouds or, you know, shooting each other with loving harps. Can you shoot people with harps? (laughs) I would totally use a harp as a bow and arrow. arrow. I'm going to, I'm going to forge my harp into a bow and arrow. (laughs) Okay, no. Wait, so, are we supposed to be doing the opposite of that what the prophet said? Well, it doesn't hurt anybody. So I could be a floaty guy with no a clothes on guy. and yeah. you know, sitting yeah. in my closet. Well, there, there are a few misconceptions, I, I think, of what we're referring to as the resurrection, right? Yeah. Um, so one of those misconceptions is uh, we are going to a place called heaven to s- spend forever. Mm. Somewhere um, else. Or paradise. Somewhere Different else. Place. Somewhere ethereal. This place is going to you know, burn. We will exist as spirits and we will be around the throne of God singing forever and ever. Yeah. Um, look, God would have to deny himself to do that. Yeah. He created us with what? <clears throat> Bodies. 
mm-hmm. brains, eyes, uh, appetites. Um, <laughs> that stuff is good. He called it good. He would deny himself if it ever became not good. So in the resurrection, yes, we're going to have bodies and they mm-hmm. will be perfect. Um, and they will be... Uh, <laughs> the audience can't see the face I'm making. <laughs> they will be better, I think, than the bodies of Adam and Eve. Mm. Right? Here's how. They will be restored to the sinless state. Adam and Eve had that. But now they will forever be inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, a forever personal connection with God that Adam and Eve didn't have pre-fall, right? Mm-hmm. They were consumed with mm-hmm. their own righteousness. They were the image of God, but with without the indwelling mm-hmm. of God, right? We will have both, and we will forever be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, which Adam and Eve were not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They couldn't. That's be. a good there, point. There was yeah. no cross, right? And so the the last state of things, the resurrection, will be better than the first, and we will still mm-hmm. labor and steward the earth. Um, so Christians, Christ is redeeming the earth and bring it to the blacktop, right? In our daily jobs, what we do with our lives, do it well. You are creating the world that you will live on forever. forever. Steward your it, job steward matters. Steward it now. Your like, work, your, your labor matters. Uh, everything you do here yeah. matters. Taking care of people on this earth, yep. it matters. A beautifying projects matter if mm-hmm. cities were full of christians there wouldn't be slums and buildings falling apart everywhere right like we will build the world that we will live on and that's what christ is doing through the church in this in his millennial reign which is now mm-hmm. he's redeeming all of creation and he's using the church to do that so what we do on this earth matters and that's why theology matters that's why end time study eschatology matters because what we believe about the eschaton about end times it's going to it, de- it determines what we're going to do with our lives now. So much. So if I'm yeah. post-millennial, I'm going to go to work with a good wo- work ethic. Right. Knowing that, hey, we're developing well systems and running diagnostics. And I am helping to beautify properties. Uh, and I'm going to do my work well because I know if I do this well and do everything I do such that it honors Christ, this work, it lives on. Books written... I think will continue to exist and we'll be able to think about them better. Um, sermons that are developed here on this earth, they go on. So work hard at them. Don't have, yeah. don't haphazardly like, I'm, I'm just going to put this together eight minutes before. Look, people will see that forever. Right. Uh, <laughs> you want to do well, right? Uh, right? Your name is on that. Um, and we'll be able to think about it and we won't like condemn one another because we did a bad job in this life, right? But our work goes on, man. Which is one of the reasons it's so important. I know, like, it it might seem for a few weeks been ragging a lot on eschatology, you know, specifically with dispensationals. Yeah, the Bible. Paul's doing it, so we're 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 just kind of joining with Paul here and having the conversation. But the reason, like, you know, and I've I've heard this again mostly from a dispensational perspective is that you know eh, you know what let's not disagree over nuances you know we'll figure out the next life the same a nuance oh my gosh <laughs> yeah because if this you're is talking plain, about plain like description. what yeah. postmillennialism does as far as like in, inspiring you to, to have meaning because you, because you have meaning and purpose and what you do matters and this life matters and this earth matters and the people here like the the opposite of that when you look at the theology that says everything's being decayed and destruct, destroyed and, and it's going to get worse and it's going to eventually be destroyed by, like completely Not by God. What the Bible like, says. What does that do to you? That right. does the opposite of what you know the, a, a, a proper biblical eschatology oh, does. It, it makes yeah. you believe that this life is pointless. Yeah. The only point to this life is to save as many as you can. And, and then keep yourself unstained from the world. And keep yourself unstained Separate from the world. Separate yourself. You don't have to do well at work. Just get to church. Make sure you get to church. You don't have to do well on... On homework, you don't have to. You don't have to really learn a lot of stuff. Just man, <laughs> life's a mist, man. It. Just, it's, yeah. It's, a, yeah, it's a vapor, and and it is a vapor if mm-hmm. you don't have Christ. But if you have Christ, you're with Him forever. Forever. And the work you do here matters. Uh, it follows you. Um, now the, the fruits, the fruits yeah. come that that are produced by our hands, mm-hmm. like endure. Yeah. Eternally. Wait a minute. <coughs> Didn't Paul say that all knowledge will pass away? <laughs> Doesn't the Bible say that? It does say that, yeah. 
And people should go back and listen to that sermon as well. <laughs> Which one was that? Uh, it was First Corinthians before this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> go listen to all this. of them. Um, no, uh, in that passage, though, he's talking about he's talking about the brain gets old and dies, like your ability to know stuff in this life. Right, it perishes, but love does not. Mm. Right. So that'd be First Corinthians thirteen. All you need is love. What is love? <laughs> Baby, don't hurt me. You took it somewhere else. I did. <laughs> don't hurt That's me. fantastic. Don't hurt. <laughs> More than a feeling. Just, all right. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 resolved or well, you came to a resolution on another we talked about actually in the recent weeks, mm-hmm. um, which was. A, a point where there is, not, no, it's not too strong. Disagreement's not too strong a word. It's, there's disagreement and disunity when it comes to the idea of the point at which death is destroyed. Mm-hmm. Defeated, so, destroyed, yeah. In verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So they, the, the argument isn't, is death destroyed? We we agree. It's not. It, no, people it, still die. No, no, that death is destroyed. <laughs> oh. I agree it's Either been defeated. Is, has yeah. been or will be is the question. Yeah. Or the evil phrase that people like already to hear. Not yet. Is it already but not yet? No. no. <laughs> it has been defeated, clearly, in the resurrection of Christ. Has not yet been abolished, mm. and that I think is the terminology I like best, which is the terminology the New American Standard uses. Yeah, um, yeah. So it has been defeated, hasn't been abolished, and I use the illustration like a conquering nation goes in, right? Mm-hmm. It defeats a people. The people has been the people have been defeated, um, but not all of them abolished, and not all the rebels abolished all at once, right? Mm-hmm. So Christ conquering this world looks a lot like that. Death has been defeated, has not yet been devol- abolished, and I think that's a matter of grace. Mm-hmm. So this is one of my thoughts during the passage, um, and this is one of those active thoughts, so feel free to give me a little pushback regardless, but I see I see death as a a, a curse from God mm. as a result of sin, like a oh, better word, wage is the biblical word, right? Mm-hmm. So it's the death is a of wage. Our sin. This is your yeah. paycheck for your sin. Yeah. Um, but man everybody has to pay it. But yeah, and then this is the interesting thing that we see because this is also talked about in Genesis. Is like, well, when he did, when Adam disobeyed God, he was still alive. So I was looking at this equation of like. The, um, the death, death being defeated in the body, just like death in the body, like death in Genesis, you have death that came, but it wasn't an immediate death in the body, Mm -hmm. but it was a death in the body because flesh wasn't decaying and and dying in in the original creation. But then you also have the reality that in Genesis there was a, a spiritual death, a separation of of God and his presence from man. Mm-hmm. So I was just thinking through the idea when I was hearing when I was just hearing the idea of like death being put to death or death being destroyed or abolished, um, would yeah. what would the, the, the parallel be there if if it was a, a bodily death and a spiritual death, comparatively, a bodily restoration and um, a spiritual restoration. So we have today in Christ, we are spiritually renewed. We have resurrected in Christ. Mm-hmm. We have been brought up. We, we have new life. He's made us new. Our spirits will never die. Our spirits will never yeah. die. And, yeah, but now you. our bodies are going to die, but they'll also be resurrected mm-hmm. at a future point. So that's yeah. kind of where my mind was going, and I don't know, I don't know what kind of yeah. Your thoughts are. Yeah, I got you. And I, I hear people all the time talking about Genesis three, like, oh, 
that's where Adam died spiritually. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't necessarily like that. Mm. Um, I've had seminary professors and everything teach it that way. Um, but I think there's a lot of speculation involved because the text doesn't say Adam died spiritually. Right. It says the, it says that he, he, he would die right. and he sinned and then God had mercy. He still died, but mm. later. Right. And so just the natural reading of the text is it's talking about physical death, but right. with the mercy and grace of God. And so I, I think maybe, um, maybe there might be some merit into reading spiritual death into that, but mm -hmm. um, you I look at it more just really plainly cautious, physical, just plainly physical. Mm -hmm. And John chapter three is the reason why, right? Because Jesus, when he's teaching, he says, you must be born again to even see the kingdom of heaven. You're born in the flesh and then you are born in the spirit. And so when Christ comes and redeems the body and moves the soul, which we would call it, right? Mm -hmm. um, replaces our hearts. That's, that's spiritual birth. It's not revival. It's just vival, according mm -hmm. to Jesus' words in John chapter 3. So that's kind of the way I see it. Like we're born spiritually at the moment Christ pulls us out of the darkness. Uh, our spirit isn't revived because it was, our spirit was dead. No, we yeah. are born spiritually at that moment, right? Uh -huh. um, so the soul still exists that lives forever. It will be resurrected. Uh, the body will be resurrected and reunited with the soul, but then we have this weird spirit this thing weird now spirit. going on, right? <laughs> Where people are born spiritually at the moment of conversion, um, mm. conversion to Christ. Um, so I kind of take Jesus' words there um, to mean that Adam and Eve, I don't know if they died spiritually or later on were at Abraham's side, which Jesus gives that as a place, you know, you have Sheol, you have Abraham's side, these two places. Um, Hades and Abraham's side, both Sheol, right? Right. Um, and so Adam and Adam and Eve. I don't know if they went to be at Abraham's side until the crucifixion, and then Jesus went to preach to the spirits in prison. And one of the the sermon he preached was, "Hey, you are born again. Mm. Let's usher, usher you to the presence of the Father. Like you, this is your spiritual birth right now." You're getting into the know. next confusing Woo. topic where it's like hey. dividing awesome. soul from spirit. It's like. What are you talking about? Talking about? Yeah. <laughs> like how do how do you, the way we have a soul and a spirit? <laughs> and that would but, so I think that you, might be part of it. I don't, but I don't I don't understand all that. Uh -huh. like, that's just where my brain goes when you talk about it. So then, what would you what do you what would you call when the presence of God leaves man in Genesis? So the dwelling that of God. So that that's not a you you I don't like the terminology spiritual death. It what would you is that just God's presence leaving? Uh, what would, but I, I think the pre-incarnate Christ lived with them in the garden. Mm -hmm. And I think at so the moment of their sin, he Christ departed. gone. I think mm -hmm. he departed to heaven with the Father. Yeah, And that would be just what you'd call it. It wouldn't be like any type of other type of death. It would just be like I just the presence it. of Christ left. Left. It's like... Yeah. Left them to their own devices. Yeah. And we saw how that turned out when we get to Genesis chapter 6, right? Mm. Every intention of the human heart is only wicked all the time. Right. Because, right. because why? Well, Christ isn't dwelling there with them anymore. Right. <coughs> yeah, definitely walking through Genesis next. That's going to be fun. <laughs> <coughs> oh, man. I've had a lot. I've put a lot of thought into Genesis 1 through 11, by the way. I know. A I... lot. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, that's, a, that's a tough group of chapters to, to understand everything that's going on. Mm. And there's a lot. Yeah, you know, we're gonna creep through it. That's the right way to do things. <laughs> yeah. Mm. When will? Man, I got excited there, and now I like, got something in my throat. And I got to it out. <coughs> you know, emotional. <laughs> Genesis you one through eleven. Yeah. <laughs> Brings you to tears. <laughs> It's just so beautiful. I mean, it does. I mean, it does, though. Yeah. And, and man, my guilty pleasure is astrophysics. Oh, man. <laughs> so, if I'm walking through Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to be like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that, that'll, that'll be another like, beautiful one, but another just intensely debated and misunderstood and, mm. and confusing area that... Yeah. that uh, as far as the creation account, because, oh man, those will be some interesting black tops too. Maybe we should just get going now. <laughs> just bounce back start, and forth. Start, start Genesis yeah. next week. And... 
You know, bounce back to First Corinthians. You only got. Let's see what we think. Probably. I think we only got a another, chapter left. Another month. Maybe. How short is chapter sixteen? Sixteen. We have nineteen. Oh yeah, that'll take us a couple of weeks. Yeah, at least. Maybe three. Yeah, maybe three weeks. Twenty. Twenty-four. Twenty-four verses. Yeah. My guess is we'll we'll be another month minimum. Minimum. That's my yeah, thought. That's my guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, that'll be fun. I would say it's it's a it's a struggle to to let go and move forward from this passage because I want I want people to really sit here. For some time, <laughs> it's well, so important. We need to, and even you know, I invited James White just a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> but James White, during one of his uh, dividing line, I think episodes, uh, he said that uh, eschatology is going to be the most important conversation we have either in the next ten years or twenty years. He said probably in the next decade. Mm. Um, what he said was pretty close to that. That's not exact wording, but it was pretty mm. close to that. And then, I think he's probably right. Like it's time for us to nail that down. Yeah, yeah, and, and and most importantly, because that will be the what drives the crazy powerful transformation in societies across the world. I think so. Yeah, it's yeah. not something new. It's not something apart from the gospel. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. Yeah. Like that's that's the transforming what God's doing. But but we we have we've been so kind of aloof and back and forth that. Once, once believers have like, don't put this idea on hold anymore. Don't say I don't understand it. You don't understand it because what you're taught is confusing. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. don't and, put it on hold anymore. And then, you know, if we don't try, strive to understand the Bible, yeah. then we're never equipped to go and teach everything that Christ commanded, which is the Bible. Right. right? We're not equipped to do evangelism. And in order to complete the work of evangelism, we have to strive to understand what we're talking about what we're actually going forth and teaching the nations right and then when the work of evangelism is done to see that glorious day when jesus hands the kingdom to the father oh, man. and and it is consummated at that moment and there are no more rulers or authorities upon the earth it's just the representative rule of humanity represented in the federal headship of jesus christ and god the father glorying in everything that's being done. Right. Like, oh my gosh. Well, you know what's awe inspiring too is what is that what does that transition look like as <sighs> that's becoming more like that like he what? actually picks his kingdom up in his hand and goes, Here, Father <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Except the Father doesn't have a body, so never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Won't work. He's gonna <laughs> let, let, let's go let's go modalism a little bit. Jesus is gonna pick up the the kingdom, and then he's gonna like trans transmit over to be the father, and and then I believe you meant to say transubstantiate trans, himself. <laughs> trans but then you himself. see, but then no. but, but then you see the God substance. That's what was revealed. The father wasn't re- like the father didn't show up in that moment. It was it was it was the God substance that's just one. Yeah, and, but it was still Christ the person and not the Father standing there. So, mm. so man, it's crazy to think about Trinity. Yeah, no, for sure. It's fun too. I, I mean, t- talking about the Trinity, like it gets us close and closer to understanding the character and nature of God. Like, and that's, you know, people have described it um, in various ways. I, no, I didn't. I was going to use it one way. I heard it described, and I don't like that. Like an ant trying to understand people. Um, I don't I think hate that's that. yeah that's not because we're actually example. in the image of God right <laughs> like everything about us is designed after God's self it's, yeah um, yeah uh, I don't know about the f- I mean something about our physical appearance is something about the transcendent Trinity God mm. but he doesn't have physical appearance like this he, d- he didn't have fingers before he right, created right them right and, and assumed human flesh right yeah. um, but it's I mean it's crazy to think about. That's well. We, you you and, just brought up another thing that's crazy to think about that the the body of Jesus didn't exist before, before the, the incarnation, incarnation. That's right. but he did. He did. Yeah. That's that's trippy too, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
and it's not Kantian because not everybody's like that. It's, mm. it's just a biblical concept. Right. Just, right. Just the eternality of Christ. That's mm-hmm. it. Um, yeah. Right. Right. How amazing is it? We can look at everything about us and say something about the fact that God gave me arms and hands reveals something about God. Right. You know what I think that is? I can reach out and I can pick up a can. I can interact with the universe around me, right? So I have reach. Mm. And that reveals something about who God is and his reach. He manipulates. Oh, sure. And he extends and he controls. Hmm. All things are in the palm of his hand. So when I reach out and pick up anything, I'm like, dude. So that would be an interesting conversation, too, that we definitely wouldn't have now at 57 minutes. But (laughs) (laughs) Um, that, like, just analyzing. Our, our beings, mm. our, our created yeah. bodies, right. and and looking through like different characteristics, yeah. and talking about what that might be imaging. Mm-hmm. Um, man, that would that would be a fun a fun evening. That would to be. Do. Take more than an evening, probably. Yeah, at least to crack the nut open, you know, so to speak. The noggin, the nut, yeah. the noggin. What does the head represent? Christ. <laughs> All right. Uh, is that is that everything, man? No, but not, yeah, not I even mean, close. We, yeah, we need another hour. I, I think we're at a, we're at a good point, I guess. Don't worry, we'll come across this idea again next week. <laughs> beauty, but Paul will not disappoint. <laughs> the, the, the beauty of walking through Scripture rather than just leaving an idea, right after a week. Yeah. Oh man. What a, what a beautiful thing. All right. Holy cow. No, let's, let's wet the whistles for next oh, week. Oh, yeah, please do. Um, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? Yeah, baby. <laughs> Talking about that on Sunday. All right. All right. Thank you so much for joining us this episode of Blacktop Pulpit. Uh, we will see you on Sunday. We are live streaming the audio now from our services. That turned out pretty good this week, so we'll continue doing mm-hmm. that. Be sure to listen if you can't join us and uh, check out Blacktop Pulpit afterwards. If you have any questions after the sermon, send them in and we'll talk about them during the show. All right, that's it. Thanks for joining us.